you a glimpse of what the store looks like and what you do every day. So it may or may not have relevance to what we're actually talking about. Have y'all, has anybody been to Small Private? Okay. Um, so we're five years old and this was uh, our building when we first opened. It was an abandoned building and it was on the trail. And um, we opened because there was no outlet for local food in Greenville, or not no reliable outlet. Out, um, if you missed this outlet, the farmer's market, there was nowhere else to go. That was once a week. <coughs> so five years ago, we set out looking for a place. Um, we quit our job, we pulled our life savings, and took out a small loan, and then opened a, a cafe, a grocery, and a bakery, and our sole mission was to source local. Um, so we had a uh, construction took a really long time, and we had a lot of time that we called pretty much anyone we knew who was involved with local food, um, and we started getting things started. Um, so just for example, at that time there was one, um, now I think it's more common, there are lots of these services where you can order online and they deliver to your house, and there's a pickup location. So there was one small thing like that. We reached out to them, and we reached out to every farmer we knew, and what was pretty impressive, I think, in the beginning is that all the farmers sold to us because, like, they were like, okay, I'll give you a $40 minimum. And then they drive from their farm that's, like, 40 minutes away and deliver, like, a puny little order for us because I think they, they Yeah, because they knew us, they believed in us, they liked us to be like them. Um, so that just goes back to, like, the key to local food is that we know each other and we help each other out. And it's just a really nice, close-knit community. Okay, so we opened in 2011. Uh, our mission was local food, and we're located in the food desert. Does everybody, anyone here know what a food desert is? We had to talk about it like just four weeks ago. Okay, oh, good. I figured you would. Um, so there's not really any outlet for healthy food for, I think, what's the radius? Test. <laughs> 10 miles, miles for suburban, no, not suburban. Yeah, 10 miles for suburban and like a mile for in the city. That sounds right. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Um, so there was, there's no place to get healthy food in the neighborhood that we're in. Um, so that was just another drive for us. And we were, since we were located on the bike trail, we felt really good about that because we would be accessible safely by walking. Um, so if somebody doesn't have a car, they could hop on the trail and walk. Um, and people actually do buy things on bikes and they have backpacks, they have baskets, stuff, and they actually grocery shop on their bikes. Um, so today, five years later, we've expanded one, two, three times um, because we've just been really busy. Uh, we've had a lot of customers come and support us throughout the years, um, a lot in part because they know their growers or they know us. It's the whole small business and small farmer, family farm feel. Um, so we've kept growing pretty well I and mean, we worked our tails off too. Um, but we, after a year or two, we opened a produce room because we had so much produce um, and not a good place to put it. So we added a room and our cafe was so busy that we opened, we expanded our kitchen. Um, and then this year we doubled our square footage and now our grocery takes over like almost half of what is, is the double part. So the grocery is a pretty significant part of our business now. That in 2011 when we first opened, um, that year we sold from or bought from 73 different vendors and this year it will be over like 300 and that is like includes like a distributor that might represent 25 farmers um so that doesn't even it's like over 300 might not even represent each little farmer that we sell from so sometimes it might be a <coughs> person that we buy pecans from or blueberries we don't see them any time of the year except for july and we just buy blueberries from them or they just bring us pecans and stuff like that so, um, you know, we used to like scramble and look at every list listed online, like, oh, we need eggs, or like, we need, um, I don't think we've ever said we needed collars, but we'll, you know, we need strawberries or whatever. <laughs> we'll look at every list and see, like, you know, what farm sells that, and we'll call them. And now, like, all the time people are reaching out to us and saying, like, I have a small farm, or I, you know, I just, um, we have extra, and we're buying from them now, they're seeking us out. Yeah, but still, our, I would say our present situation is there's not enough farmers. There's certain things that we're always seeking out and we can never get enough of. 
And some of it's because it doesn't grow as easily here. Like, we can never get enough local broccoli. We can never get enough local spinach. Um, those are also really popular um, things. But also, like, for a small meat farmer, we can never get enough, like, popular cuts like ribeye because there's only, like, a certain number of ribeyes per cow. And it's not a factory farm, so this farmer who comes every two weeks just gives us, like, three ribeyes. So um, there's still a high need, I think, for us. We're sourcing from 300 farms, but we still can't get enough. Um, so that's, and also currently we're, um, we're adding pizza to our operations. And we're always looking for outlets to sell, to, to prepare and use and buy more local food. And so some of these pictures might be kind of funny. So I can tell by your faces. Um, so we're gonna do pizza. The pizza's gonna use local flour and it's going to use local ingredients. And we're also doing prepared food because it's another way to get more local food out there. So a customer might buy something like a chicken pot pie. And um, everybody really loves our chicken pot pie, but we got one comment that it has really weird vegetables in it. Because the real, the real thing we're trying to do with selling these things is we want people to try weird vegetables that grow really well here. So there's things like rutabaga in there, and there's things like purple sweet potatoes in there. And those are things that the grocery often has struggled selling because a lot of people aren't familiar with it and don't know that it's delicious. Um, and also, we also do cooking classes. It's just another effort to educate people on ways to use local food. Um, and then in our future, uh, the pizza's coming probably in two weeks, um, but this is a new announcement, is we're gonna open a butchery. Um, so we applied for a grant from the USDA, and our purpose was to be able to sell more meat. Because right now, you're not gonna see, probably not gonna see a picture of our meat because it all comes um, vacuum sealed, uh, vacuum packed and frozen with usually a really ugly label um, because that's the only way a farmer can pack, a, local, a small farmer can package it. They have to go to a processor like two hours away, <coughs> get a package, pick it up, and then deliver it to it frozen. And just from a marketing standpoint, uh, a lot of this, it just looks unattractive. And when you're, your typical grocery customer wants to see like a fresh meat and they don't want to buy a frozen meat, even though it's frozen, right after it's processed, so in a way it's fresher, um, there's just that hurdle to getting people to buy more meat. So with that goal in mind, we applied for the grant and we were worth it. So um, and over the next five years, hopefully we will have open a butchery. Um, so we're really excited about that. Yes? Does that mean that you will cut the, the meat fresh or or and or does that mean that people can bring their meat to you to get it? Stuff? Like a customer couldn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. farmers would still directly bring our meat, but instead of bringing it all vacuum sealed and already pre-cut, they would bring us like big primal cuts, and then okay. we would break it down. They're not quite doing the processing uh, facility there. Yeah. The We're not killing them. Yeah. We're just like cutting them. We're making ground beef, we're making our own sausages, we're making, cutting our own steaks. Like, you know, you can get them at dinner as thick as you want, pork chops and stuff like that, bacon. But, um, or we could do like, you know, feta and spinach stuff <coughs> and breast and things like that because we can, you have to have different, there's different laws with meat. And so we will be able to meet those laws. So we looked into processing because that's a, just as a student, I think it's good to know these things. There's, that's a really, it seems to be a really high need for a better way to process animals. That's one of the biggest complaints from our farmers is that it takes a lot of time and they are at the mercy of just one or two processors and there can be mistakes um, with when they drop things off. So we, we wanted to somehow partner with someone or add that into our um, project, but it, we, it's way beyond anything that we could do. That's a really big deal. So. Um, so our main point though here is to talk to you guys about the challenges um, and just the process of a small business trying to source locally. And I think we mentioned one of them, one of our biggest ones is like just imagine every week you're ordering from, I guess in any given week, depends on the season, like 150 <coughs> individual orders that you have to put in. And just the logistics of that, like we pay a full-time person um, on the staff, and that's her sole job is just to call this farmer, see what he has available, see what his prices are, call that farmer, and then all that stuff, see when it all, it's all going to come in, um, price everything, 
uh, label everything correctly because we label our things, our items with the farm that it came from. Um, and so just that alone is a huge um, time commitment. And so they, I think local food has now become pretty popular and I feel like there's no restaurant that doesn't open without saying we source local. But a lot of our farmers, this is the feedback we get from our farmers is that we, we really, really do it because like we didn't have eggs last Sunday and that's our biggest, one of our biggest sales day. But at this time of year, chickens won't and they don't lay eggs. So we have 20 egg farmers, but we didn't have enough eggs, so we just didn't sell eggs. That's like a big challenge for a grocery store to give up selling eggs. But if we were a grocery store without the sole mission to sell local food, then I think we would have just gotten conventional eggs because that's, that's what it's the practical running a business part. You do kind of have to do that. Um, but we're willing to go with that. Um, so just the volume of orders and logistics of coordinating with all those farmers. <coughs> and then um, the paying of those farmers uh, like all of that, just, just the paying bills alone um, at, probably costs us more than our rent does. Just because like manually entering all of that information, printing a check, sending a check, making sure it's on time, checking farmer masks and then stop. Like a lot of that stuff, I think, um, you don't think about when you just think, oh, it's nice they get from the farmer, but there's a whole bunch of background work that we put into making it work and maintaining a good relationship. We had like a huge learning curve with that, like just with working with a lot of individual farmers and like the first day we opened, we froze $700 worth of um, produce like the night. We pulled down the like shades on the, the cooler and we got to the next morning, like everything was frozen, like day one that we opened. Um, but the farmers have actually helped us in like keeping the produce nice and teaching us like how to display it and things like that. But then we've also had to deal with like, you know, we joke, we joke with one of our meat farmers and be like, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we just called Cisco and they brought us the same delivery every week and we just cut and prepared it. And he's like, you know what would be easier if I put my pigs in a building and sent them in so I don't have to use them all the time on concrete. So I can't, you know, and like, neither one of us would ever do that, but like, um, it's, you know, he goes to these painstaking like efforts to have his pigs out roaming, eating, and then he chases them around. And um, we do the same thing chasing farmers around because like, uh, I always feel like farmers are kind of like artists. Like they really like are so proud of their product. And um, but sometimes like the business part of things, like for us, we need to know what we can buy so that we can sell it. And we're trying to maintain a level of consistency so that we can be like convenient to customers. But they'll just be like, isn't this the prettiest, um, you know, tomato you've ever seen? Well, like, yes, it is. But like, how many pounds do you have? Like, oh, well, you know, like we need like numbers and stuff. And so um, we'll have farmers that are saying like, I'll bring you 40 pounds of spring mix tomorrow. And then they don't show up because the tractor broke or like they didn't have help picking and washing that day so they just had to wait till the next day and that is pretty um, costly for us when that happens or like we had um, that a meat farmer who his farm got infected with some sort of worm or something and he had to cut hay like that minute so we didn't get our delivery because if not he was going to lose like all his hay um, so that kind of stuff like happened and so and it's not like oh that happened with that one farmer that week it's like oh that happened with like a percentage of our farmers that week which is like a handful and so it is hard to juggle all of that and be like where did where did that stuff come from and we've even tried to you know we would take what we, you know people will come to our store and they'll have a box of lettuce and you know it's completely legal for us to sell that lettuce um like produce is very highly regulated but where they'll interrupt us, the lettuce will be picked. It's a lot of pressure for us because we don't have to send somebody away that's to pick this beautiful lettuce, but they also have an invoice and then they expect to get paid. And like, so it's a lot of juggling that we've kind of had to learn. And then, like, in the last <laughs> year, we've tried to like tell farmers our needs and have them grow for us. And we, we get asked, I say, like, all the time, at least once a week, like, what do you need more of? And we say, like, the same three things every time like, spinach, carrots, broccoli. And so you would think by now, we have more but for some reason nobody likes to grow those three things because we never have enough and we like always say that we, I've probably told like 35 people like 
recently, if that's what we need. Um, but, you know, then we get inundated with okra and eggplant and peppers um, and things like that. So it's been a big learning curve. But even when we've, like, tried to forecast with farmers, like, farming is just not a very forecastable thing. Like, a lot of things come up, on it, especially on a small farm. And so we have to roll with it. And we have to have, and that's how we have to have a relationship with a bunch of farmers because when somebody is shorting us on something, we usually, somebody else can bring it in. Um, and same with the eggs. Like, it is really important to have those relationships with farmers because <coughs> it's really hard for us to be a grocery store that runs out of eggs. But it happens when all the tickets, when all the egg production goes down. And so we ask our farmers, like, they'll make tricks just to bring us seven dozen, of egg, seven dozen eggs just to give us through one day until, like, the next delivery from, like, North Carolina might come in the next day, just so that we can be as convenient as possible for our customers. Um, and here's another example of how we help each other out. There's a, you know, Greenville has a big farmer's market, and farmers are harvesting, like, a lot the days ahead of time, but last weekend it was canceled the day before at 2 p.m. because uh, it was going to be really windy. <coughs> So all of our farmers had harvested all of this, um, all of these crops, and then they didn't have the outfit to sell it. So we took a whole bunch in. So it was kind of risky, but then we did a sale, and then it worked out, and we were able to move a lot of produce. So we helped them out, and then, you know, it goes both ways. Like when we really need something, like we might have a catering order, and we promised roasted broccoli, and then we didn't get it in. Um, like we can call our farmers, and sometimes they'll make a special trip and help us out and to ask somebody to drive like 45 minutes to drop off like a 40 dollar order doesn't make sense but it does when you're building a relationship and we buy 300 dollars worth of produce from them a week but we really needed this extra bit and stuff so it does work so the relationships have been really worth uh, fulfilling for us that we know <coughs> our farmers and then we, we have been trying really hard to make best efforts to visit all of our farms um, because it's good to know how, how people are growing things, and it's good to see what they're doing. Um, and then on the negative side, we have had at least two experiences where a farmer came with stuff, and we bought, it was like, it was a great looking product, and it sold well, and then we started to get weird clues mm -hmm. that that stuff might not have been grown around here, because nobody else had it, or it looked too perfect. Um, so we had at least two experiences, I can remember, of we, we um, found a new farmer, bought their stuff, sold it for a few weeks, and realized that they weren't growing it. Um, we tried to visit their farm, and we were allowed to, so that you know, raised alarm for us, um, and we stopped selling it. So that's why now we, we try to pay close attention to clues if something seems off or unusual. Um, and then just in general, we get a new farm that we don't, we don't know, and nobody that we know knows or even have a reference, then we try. But it is really hard to get out to every single one of them. You have questions? Oh, I thought you were raising um, But in the in the two biggest clues are one is if they always have the same availability every week, like that's probably like the biggest clue. Like every week they have fifty dozen eggs, like that never happens. Or like every week they can bring in forty pounds of spinach, and that never happens either. Or a few of their onions have stickers on it. Say hundred. But also the other farmer. Uh, we'll sit there and say like they didn't grow that. I know that that was not grown here. And um, and actually both times helpful. that was the clue is another farmer told, which is you know which is good because it's fair and we don't want to be we don't want to be lying or you know caught giving out the wrong information. So and our goal is to like communicate to our customers like what farming practices were used because they really care. A lot of them really care. Like they want to know like where it was grown and what it like. <laughs> organically grown, was it um, GMO free seed, was it pasture raised, all that kind of stuff. And like generally all of our produce is like using uh, mostly like what you would call organic practices, but except for our fruit it is very conventionally grown um, because that's what grows around here and it's um, really popular. Except we do buy Clemson fruit and we do buy like what's in your fruit out of Columbia. But, um, but we just try to label everything and we you know, if a farmer is cutting corners, we don't want to, um, we want to communicate that to our customers because they will ask, for sure. Yes? Oh, just one way. Okay, no, it came back. Okay. So would somebody that was trying to get you to buy 
their their vegetables or uh, farm grown something? What's that like? Are they trying to con? Do they like go around wanting to con different local grocery stores into it? Like, or is it would they just get it crazy? What do you suppose? Suppose because it's not like you would know, but I think one of them was a really great farm, and then they got into bad health, okay. and they kept trying to fill the order by like, you know, buying conventional something that's like a dollar a dozen and selling it to us for four dollars a dozen. And so I think that's what happened with one of the farms. Mm -hmm. I think another one was a farmer that just knew like that they could just go to the Columbia Farmers Market and supplement what they were making with additional. And the Columbia Farmers Market is called a farmers market, but it's not really like local. So you can just go there and buy a bunch of produce. It's not grown in South Carolina even. Like they just import vegetables. Like they have both. But um and that person was doing that. And then I think one was really a con kind of artist. I think I can remember three cases of different farms. And yeah. so when like and when we when we broke up with the one it was it wasn't pleasant. The other two we just kinda fizzled out. Like we just said like you know, we don't think you're going this, we're not going to buy from you anymore. And they just left it. And the other one the, the con artist was a little meaner. <laughs> and every time it just like crushes our hearts like to have to deal with that. Yeah, and we we don't we don't take it lightly if you see someone like you try really hard like we just try to go to the farm because that's the very easiest thing we could do is see the stuff growing and so we weren't allowed to do that. Um, but one of them we found through the South Carolina Grown SC Grown website, um, and I think we even reported to the con artists, but there, there was some yeah they don't like verify their farm like if you yeah. out their paperwork <coughs> and you say that you sell like. Uh, from South Carolina, like they just believe you. That's so really that interesting. Big bummer for us. Hole in the system. <laughs> um, so that, but that has been a very, very minor um, part of our business. Like, like three, yeah, I think three or four, four farms out of like 500 that we've sold for because they come and go. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of farmers come and go out of business. Speaking of which, so that's also really sad because it is. It's really hard to make it as a farmer. I mean, I hope some of you become farmers because we need more farms. But it's hard to make it. A lot of our farmers um, have a, have other jobs um, or just like rely on a partner's income to make it uh, because their income is just really variable. Um, one of our farmers even worked for us during the off season. Um, so we're really happy about that partnership. Um, Every single time she delivers, we get you like to go make me a sandwich. She makes sandwiches. And another thing with work, like with knowing our farmers, is we develop relationships with them, and there's sometimes there's a little bit of jealousy. Um, also, not a huge part, but it's also whenever it does happen, it's stressful for us. But you know, we might buy farmers from one tomato. One we might buy tomatoes from one farmer because they are just they look so much better and they sell so much better and it's a good price. Not so much for the other one because they might be double the price. And with the other one, you know, we might have known for five years and then they see we're selling someone else's tomatoes. Um, so we feel bad and then they feel bad. So we try to talk to people when, you know, there's a problem with the price or um, we try to actually, what we really do is we try to end up buying from everybody. Um, and what we do in those cases is we just kind of sacrifice our profit. A little bit. So, like eggplant, for example, we were buying it from some farmers for $1.60 a pound, and then other farmers we were buying it for $2.75 a pound. And it was just really hard for us to, you know, we try to negotiate, but it's just, it is hard to negotiate with certain farmers. If you know, it's hard for them to make a living as it is. Um, so, they still get sales so if you're, if you're, if you have like the, the quantitative information it's like well this one is a dollar fifty and here's two seventy five. We could be buying everything that one farmer is growing, like every we'll take every single thing that you grow, we will buy it, we promise. But you don't have enough, so we're gonna buy from another farmer in addition to that and they'll still get jealous. <laughs> so it, yeah, and pricing is one of the like really difficult parts because we wanna be as affordable to the customer as possible, and but we want to pay, pay fair prices to farmers because you know all of our farms that we buy from are like small, sustainable, small to mid-sized, like sustainable farms, and they're not paying like migrant workers like a dollar for you no know, dollar for per hundred pounds or whatever you know 
migrant farmers get paid. They're like they're supporting a family and sometimes multiple families. So we try to pay them like a just um, amount. And uh, but then we want to sell it too. And so like I don't know if y'all like have ever thought about this. <coughs> Produce weighs like ten percent more when you buy it than when you sell it, just because like things shrivel. And so that's called um, <coughs> for shrinkage. And, so, um, and then you know there's also like the obvious the spoilage and you know, some things have like a very small short shelf life of um, produce. And so we're lucky because we are a cafe and bakery, so we can use some of that stuff. Um, like we had a picture of grapes galette and we we buy grapes from the Happy Berry and um, for some reason and I don't think it's price and they're just, and they're also good, but I think it's habit and they look a little different is um, like they're just not super popular. And you would think grapes are like a really common you know, fruit that kids like everybody likes to buy at the store. But we just don't sell a lot of them. So we try to use them in the grocery. Like we have, I mean, in the cafe, we went into the grape galette. We made like peanut butter and jelly smoothies, and the jelly was like the grapes and stuff. And we did smoothies because this farmer has all this product, and we want to support them. And so we do it the best that we can. Yeah. Do you guys, um, like, I know there's extra utilization for canning and stuff like that. Do you guys have like a kitchen for all that? Or? No, we can't not? can. But we can. Uh, like it's a DX certified kitchen, so we do sell like things wholesale. So okay. we can we can, but we can't sell meat wholesale. Yes, so that will happen, and that's like um, a government like agency nightmare. Um, so we're just gonna navigate that um, maybe after Christmas. But like we do, uh, we sell the Mother Earth produce out of Asheville that delivers to people, and so we can sell them any of our prepared foods like our veggie enchiladas or um, any of our veggie stuff. Yes. Five years on, are you running out of energy? Are you exhausted? Do we look tired? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with the way we you didn't come here to get insulted. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I, the headaches you describe, I think I'd be about done after three. There must be right. something you find very rewarding. And, yeah, we could talk And you've grown, like, as you mentioned, three times. I think our kids exhaust us way more than it is in this. Um, we all, we both had um, two kids in the last four years. So I was seven and a half months pregnant when we opened. <laughs> wow. And then her her first baby was born the day before mine a year later. So we've always been pregnant or had an infant and we didn't send them to, um, and it's like kind of time and like our customers are like letting us know that it's time, like he's pregnant. And, um, <laughs> nobody right now. And, um, <laughs> So that is really tiring to do that, but we also have the benefit of like we get to bring them, our kids to work with us. Like when my first was, um, we didn't have babies there until he was 18 months old. So I just carried him around in a little ergo, and like the staff helped out. We were a lot slower, and like a delivery would come in the front door, and he'd run to get the price gun and stuff. And so it was helpful to help the kids around. But um, we also like, I don't know, it's kind of, it's been a trip. Like the the customers and the farmers are all like really supportive like not all there's like this like two percent that are really like difficult and not fun but in general like it's been crazy um like people want local food like people people believe in what we believe in and like and the farmers want to sell them fates are all bound up together yeah i'll get like theory diet but like it's like what we like well um it's just like a neat thing that um you know, like there's good things and bad things, and like we strive to do like all the things, all of like boxes that are good, and then when we're able to be successful in that, like it's a really good feeling to be like, <coughs> well, we pay our employees well, we pay our farmers well, like, and we haven't gone out of business. People always point out like, oh, usually restaurants go business in five years, and like we haven't. I mean, you know, it's been a lot of work. We don't make a lot of money. We work all the time and stuff like that. But to be successful. In like doing those things is really kind of cool. Did, did you have to reinfuse the place with cash? I don't know if that's proprietary information, but I'm wondering. You probably started with something like two to five employees, and maybe today you have 15 to 25. So you've grown. Mm -hmm. The place is paying for itself. I imagine. I'm, I'm wondering how. So when we how do, the turnover is, what the markup is, how you know if you could duplicate that success, say in uh, I don't know Spartanburg, or Clemson, the Swamp Rabbit Cafe, for example. Maybe. We, we've been approached a lot about a second location, but we don't, we feel like, we still feel like we would need to be there. 
And so we don't we feel like we would be stretched too thin to make it work because because we can't duplicate it because if you in Spartanburg, I think we would have a kind of another pool of farms right there. So we'd kind of have to start from scratch and develop all those relationships um, from the beginning. However, to some extent, you can just go and try to do what we did, and it may or may not work. But like, so we do have to put, we have had to put money back in at times. Yeah. And like this year, because we did like so many capital projects, like our, we kind of like, our business like doubled in April, which was like ahead of our expansion. And then we had to expand and, uh, so we, we just will pay ourselves all here, um, but hopefully, like, it pays off at times, but not, like, like if we had to support our families, we couldn't right now, yeah. but, but, like, we're not, like, completely working for free, so if you eat really good food, yes, oh, yeah. vegan food, and, like, yeah, we do have this, like, Well, the value of your business is quintuple, I imagine, when you build it, the value is added to the business itself. Yeah, but, it, right. So that it, the day ever came where you needed to sell it. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's ever offered to buy our business. Um, but, and we do have like uh, 45 employees now. So, 45. Wow. And probably a quarter of them work so less than. Yeah, let's say one guy that delivers deliver bread for us. So he works like two and a half hours a week. But we probably have like about 16 or so, like 30 yeah. to 40 hour employees. And like, Employees probably need more love from your children too. Like they all just need they like, talk to you and um, just a lot of love. So, and I think anybody that runs a small business always says like employee management is like one of the most difficult things, and we would agree. But in our business, I do like on their from their perspective, it's really hard I think to work for us because everything changes like every single day. Like one day we have persimmons. And customers don't know what they are, so we have to try to educate our staff on what they are and how they're grown. And then the next day, we don't have persimmons. And then two weeks later, we have persimmons, but they're a different price and it's a different farm. And so I think that's the big challenge is a lot of employees, <coughs> and we all want them to be knowledgeable, or at least like know specific, easy answers, but with a constantly rotating um, inventory and farmer supplier, um, that makes it really challenging. And the same, like, the, the farmers want love, too, and, like, we do love everybody, but, like, sometimes we just, like, have to get something on, like, payroll, and, like, you just can't, like, talk about, like, what's going on in the farm, and, um, and that might hurt their feelings or something, but, um, <laughs> but, this one I want? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it is, um, can't do it all every day. Right, but now we have good employees, too, that can, like, give their love to the farmers, and, um, so it's just working out really well. And our employees do love the farm. Like the, they get you kind of have to to work for us. Like I mean, that is the yeah the point. Is when they come in, they get fond over. Oh gosh, we'll take pictures. So it is it's fun. Awesome. Yes. Do you guys compost any of your? That's funny. We yeah, never write it down. Write down. We wanted to bring it up that we we do, yes. but it's been a really big struggle. Like so, we have all these farmers, and they use compost. So then we were letting farmers pick it up, but it was just, it is really it's surprisingly hard. To just do a reliable compost. Like if the farmer just forget, which happens a lot, or just doesn't come for a week, then we start piling up all this compost and then it smells. And then like our employees are like, what should I do with all this compost? And like, I don't know, I can't think about it right now, I have to do payroll. And so um, so we do, we have been composting and we still do, um, but now we're paying heavy, there's a new company that composts. And we're paying the company a service that they come and pick it up once a week. But we actually have more compost than what they can take from us right yeah, now. Yeah, we can afford to pay them. Is it ever something that could be regulated to sell? Well, know? that's what this company's doing. They're called Atlas, and they're renting it's like a public private partnership. They're renting space from Quintinity's landfill, and they're composting like on a, you know, a really large level so it's really, really hot so which is a good benefit to us so that we can put in like any like small farmers can't really compost <coughs> as many napkins as we have or like compostable plates that we have because it just doesn't compost it's just too much but they can do they can take they can even take meat and stuff and um and then they're selling the compost so we can pay them to take our garbage and then we can pay them to buy back our compost like it, as you know dirt or whatever um there's a business in Charlotte, there's these guys that have a bicycle trailer and the trailer is the compost tumbler and they pick up from restaurants and then as they ride they're tumbling it. So we'd really love it if somebody would open a business like that. And then we, I don't know, I think 
the cooks and farm, I think that's something with the soldier flies. And so some of the farmers were trying to commit us to do that, and they were going to bring us the soldier flies. But I'm sure we would have killed them. But they never brought them, and so like we just like had this conflict, like waiting for our soldier flies to come. They didn't. When we first, we used there used to be a nonprofit that gardened on our property, and we were composting on site, and that was easy and manageable. And then we got really big, and they dissolved, and um, then we had this compost situation. But we are working with a farmer right now who is going to pick up our access, and because we've gotten, we think we've gotten our system down. And we'll see. Uh, another potential outlet for all this compost would be from a composting. I know there's, there's a big company in Greenville and also in Anderson that's just red worm composting, basically. And those, those worms will eat basically anything you can throw them as long as you can kind of optimize the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So they'll take all of your paper, all of your your mm -hmm. produce scraps, and any of that really. Perma. Perma compost. Thank you. Kelly. Um, what what can do any, or what's been the best streamlining effort that you think had to do, or have you had to do anything, or where you started out in one direction and you just decided it's not working, and like choosing a single day where farmers have to deliver, or <laughs> but, I mean, has there been anything that really you've done that's really made a big difference as far as making it easier for you? And you, um, I'm just curious, like what along the way, what you've learned, how to streamline your processes. We're about to make the big jump of requiring them to bring an invoice when they deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like that should have been a requirement. If you're gonna like deliver something, you expect to get paid for it. Like, oh, I'll email it, or we can write it right there. But um, we opened our expansion in July, and that has like a, a loading dock and a whole area for receiving orders, and that streamlined like <coughs> we used, like farmers deliveries, everything used to just come straight for the front door with the customers, and then like if we were too busy to unload the order, it just sat there in the middle of the ground, and the customers walked around it. Like we never had a back area, and so we just got a back area in July. And managers. Yeah, I mean, that was that's been like personally our yeah. biggest. Thing. About a year ago, we handed off like the ordering. Where before it was just us, we alternated days for the most part, and then like I would call a farmer, and then she would call the same farmer an hour later or the next day, and so and it, ordering takes a lot of time, and so being able to hire managers and trust them um, to handle all the stuff we used to do, <coughs> as well as we did um, was really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever consider a like a co-op model, or what do you think about the you know compare and contrast like a co-op versus like what you guys are doing? We thought about it, and like well, like certain times where we don't make any money, like why don't we just do a nonprofit? We don't make any money anyway. But then um, we we're just too busy actually to really look into it, like whether it would benefit or not. But what we do know is just the way we work now is because we're just a for-profit business, we could just make decisions and just go for it. And we don't have to run it by anyone. And I do think just from, we know other um, nonprofits or co-ops, and it just does seem like where we're able to run and just, just go ahead and buy this thing from this farmer or like buy this sink that we're going to use to wash produce because We've been doing it like we just do things and we learn by doing <coughs> So we made a lot of mistakes too. But so there's not really an answer. We've, we've thought about it, whether it'd be worth it, but we don't have time to look at And I feel like the co ops we visited, like, I mean, I guess you can make your bylaws or whatever, however you want, but they seem to be more organic focused where we, I mean, we appreciate organic as much too, but we try like our hardest to source from the farmers and we don't, like, so we don't have to report to a board, we don't have to report to our members. We just have to. We have to satisfy our customers, but just do it if we want to. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, I mean, you're, you know, providing a definite benefit because you're sourcing local, sustainable farms, all that stuff. I mean, you might charge a little more, but still, the, your customers are benefiting. So I'm just wondering if there's some way to capture some revenue from that. Just thinking, you know, like, I guess, from a selfish standpoint or something. I mean, I don't know. The certified B corporations too that Monday. <coughs> this year is like construction and capital projects, so we don't really do anything other right. than that and keeping the business afloat. <coughs> but if there's like an intern that wants to do all that research, like, <laughs> <really opposed> to it. <laughs> I think you had a question or is it about? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Um, 
very like very neat. Yeah. I just wondered if you guys work with any banks on taking out loans, so how that went, or what what kind of model they used for, to figure out you know, whether you were a, a good risk or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Well, when we first opened, we applied for this grant. It was a small um, loan from the Redevelopment Authority, and I think in that case, <clears throat> they just had a, like a pool of money, and it was a small loan. Um, and they approved that. Standard. Yeah, they, they wanted to give us money. In that case, it was when the, there was a recession and they had this money, I forget like what that was kind of called, but it was kind community of community development. It had to be in the county, like it was just something. Yeah, and it was like a program trying to bring people out of the recession to like help small businesses that were wanting to start or struggling. Oh yeah, we had to make jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so we got a load from them. They didn't have very many applicants <clears throat> because nobody was starting business back then. So, we got that to start with, and then we were both pretty frugal, so we had savings. And then, not only did this past this year that we got like a real loan to expand, and we paid that one off. Like they gave us like a year without interest, so we used that, and then after that year or whatever, <coughs> we paid it off. But then now this year we did get another loan, and then so we worked with like the, we met with like every major bank in Greenville, and, and they all rejected us, yeah. including Wells Fargo. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, is there a scandal option? Yeah. Oh. And in that time land, there is no Wells Fargo scandal. But um, so we ended up working with the Greenville Federal Credit Union, which we would highly recommend, and uh, they were great. And then in order to like make everything that we wanted to do happen, we had to get a loan from the Appalachian Development Corporation, which is another nonprofit bank. And so you do have to do all that you have to provide all this information and. And they put, they, so we got a huge loan from the Greenville Federal Credit Union and a smaller one for the ABC. And they put, gave us this like eight pages of stipulations that we had to meet. And like one was like how, like how much our payroll had to be limited to this year. And like we've blown it out of the water. And so um, we're, hoping we're assuming that as long as we keep paying our loans, they're not going to get mad about that. So we'll just see what happens, I guess, when they figure that out. Uh, but yeah, you just have to like fill out their paperwork. And show them your financials and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And to, for us, we're very seasonal. So had we like some quarters, we're much more eligible for a loan than other quarters. So it's 425 now, and some of you missed that. Okay. But Jack and Mary should give extra time if there's some questions. And yeah. Know. Yeah, we were going to go to the farm. How much muscadine do you have right now in terms of raw quantity? I think we're over muscadine. Done.
And I'm really. It's you know, the one time you have to raise them indoors, and, and when they're three years old, plant them. They shoot right up. I've got three edible sized things in the frost. Which is coming in the next two weeks or so. We'll arrest it. But I wanted to prove I could do it, and I did. Yeah, we'll try it. Well, this has always been good. Yeah, we have to grow on campus. And then, um, but like, we will go to get those extra, like, growing season. So there's, like, um, kind of a hoop house called Appalachia in June. And they go to Asheville. And this weekend that we go to Asheville. Clean up at the farm this morning. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, yeah, you can communicate with them. And, like, sometimes we're having trouble getting money out from around here. So we were going to want some of our trails to be in the border. And we just kind of, like, label that stuff. I can tell him. No, it makes sense. And when you're untucked in the Northwest yeah. corner of South Carolina. Yeah. There's counties in Georgia. Yeah. There's counties in Georgia, North Carolina, that are closer yeah. than the neighboring yeah. counties in South Carolina. That was awesome. Maybe someday I'll work on my path. I have to apply to Sunshine. Well, you mentioned Harry yeah. Berry. Yeah. That's a good um, pitch. Can you tell <laughs> the great growers <laughs> that tell the rest of you on one hand yeah. what it takes Thank you so much. It's one. Because there's just not that many tilled acres planted. Oh, yeah, thanks. It's awesome what you got going on. Oh, I thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you might not think that some days. Um, okay. Okay. So, grape grapes, like, they're like, 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 table grapes, I think is what they call them. But, like, muscanines and scuppernons, we can get probably from, like, what, like, five hours. I felt like with so, Jake, right, like, a that, that, There's not many vineyards. Vendors in the upstate, in Oconee well, County, alone. Yeah, I think so, like, they sell a record. They yeah. sell, they, 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 those guys they they sell their grape production. Yeah, that's true. They throw it all in their bottles, yeah. and who can blame them? Chatuga Bells and Happy Berry will let you come pick your own, yeah. which is maybe what I'm down to. And we do love Chatuga Bell, but we don't buy it very much. We don't have to do we were for a while because they were coming. Yeah, that's my favorite But they were coming to get their kids. They were going to drop off, but now they got too big. We got too big. I mean, they'll email us and say, what grades did you get? Or like, do you have any product suggestions? We don't have a minimum, but if you only have like, so you you guys did a great job of kind of answering how you got started. It was a real community effort and all. Um, but when you first sat down, and I'm, I'm sure you had like multiple Excel spreadsheet headaches. How, how did you coordinate with farmers? How did you reach out to them? How did you set your your product list? And how did you ensure that that was all in stock and ready to go when you opened the doors? So yeah, it depends on the side organized. It's more fly by the seat of your pants. So like, it's all email and phone. We were just calling people, emailing them, and. They were, um, you know, it would come in and we would add it to our POS system as it came in. But like, you did, and people really would go you know, without warning and say, like, I have a farm in Korea and I drove it. Yeah, 